everybody? Come on. Good morning, everybody. It's such a beautiful fall day out there. I thought there would just be a lot of energy in this place. I mean, the sun actually does that. So what do you do in the midst of COVID-19 when you have to virtually do everything? Well, you got to give virtual hugs. You got to give virtual high fives. So will you do me a favor? Will you stand up and would you eye somebody in front of you or beside you? Just point at them. Give them a high five. Give them a virtual hug. Do something. Welcome to those online. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. It's good to see everyone out this morning and having you online. So thanks for doing that. You can be seated. Uh, my name is Craig Danielson, the lead pastor here at Calvary, and we are so glad that you have decided to join us online and even here in person. We want to let you know of one thing right up front and one thing only this week. Uh, we always have quite a bit of family news, but this is one thing that we really want to have you get stuck with. And so September 9th is this next Wednesday, and that's the deadline for pre-registering for our service on the 13th. We have our big kickoff service on the 13th, and part of our kickoff is actually having lunch together. So if it's good weather, we're going to have a roast beef dinner together, roast beef lunch together out in the parking lot. If it's bad weather, we're still going to have the food, but you get to drive up to the back and we will bring it out and serve you, and then you'll go home. So it's, if it's nice and dry and sunny, we're going to have it out in the parking lot. If it's wet, with liquid sunshine, I call it, we are going to give you the lunch, and you can take it home, all right? But you have to pre-register by September 9th. So that's this Wednesday. So that's all we want you to know. We're excited about that. We're into our basically three Sundays of our Vision Sundays so that you that are here in person and those online can hear kind of where we're going for the fall. And so we're really excited about that. I haven't seen Pastor Andrew yet. Pastor Andrew was at a baptism this morning in Lake Ontario. So yeah, yeah, he was a little chilly probably, but you know what? Better him than me, all right? But no, it was good. But I haven't seen him walk in yet, so hopefully he'll be, he, he'll be here soon. But we are just raring to go this morning. I'm glad to see you. Would you just stand with me as I call us to worship and prayer? And uh, the band is going to uh, just lead us in some music ministry, and uh, then we will get into what we're doing this morning. So, Father in heaven, thank you again for a new morning. Uh, thank you for a chance to be here in person and online. And God, I pray that you would um, engage our hearts in who you are. Uh, would your Holy Spirit have freedom uh, to bring us to where you want us individually, but also as a church and also as families? So God, uh, help us to grow this morning. Would you transform us by your spirit? And God, as we sing, may we sing from the depths of our being, knowing that your grace is enough. So God, thanks again, and I ask all this in your name. Amen. Let's worship together. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory. The king above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? 
a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like a sun in all of his brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me For a song in itself is 
standing. One of the great things about being part of a church family in person and even, even online is that uh, we can worship together in a variety of ways. And through prayer, through music ministry, uh, through just a glance at one another, just, man, I, I, I am with you on this. But the other way is through the Lord's Supper. And see, the Lord's Supper shouldn't be just something that's tacked on. It needs to be part of our experience of worship. And I think sometimes it ends up feeling like it's tacked on. And, and, and I take responsibility for sometimes because it's just like, oh, we've got to hurry up to the end of the service and we've got to do communion. Well, today it's going to be at the front end of our service. And so I hope that you, as you walked in, that you we're able to grab a uh, communion, the, the communion elements. And right now, Phil's going to read some scripture to just keep us focused on, on that heart of worship and who Jesus is, because that's what it's all about. And so I'm just going to ask you to just, uh, just bow your heads, and uh, whether you're here in person or online, and whether you're online scrambling to the fridge, whatever that may look like to you, because it's early in the service, um, we want to enjoy worship with the Lord's Supper. And so God, I pray that uh, by your Holy Spirit that you would just continue to engage our hearts in who you are. That Lord Jesus, it is all about you. And Lord, as we sing those songs and we hear scripture and we hear your word, and there's nothing like experiencing you in the midst of remembering the great sacrifice that you, Jesus, made for us. And so, Lord Jesus, will you just continue to guide us? Would you direct us as together? in spirit no matter where we're at we remember you with this little cup of juice and this wafer or bread or whatever we, else we have in our hand that make a statement a statement that you loved us and you went all the way for us and so as we do this just continue to lead and guide us. And so, church family, listen to these words as they're read for us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which for, 
which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So in our heart of worship this morning, and you have the symbols right in front of you, I would like you to take out this, that little wafer. And again, this little wafer, whatever you have online holding in your hand, this is a symbol of Christ's mutilated body for each one of us. And again, as we just continue to stay in that heart of worship, church family and guests, this is a symbol of the body of Jesus. Let's take it together and eat it together. And also in your hand is a a little cup of juice that is a symbol of Jesus' shed blood for us. And I would just like to say that this little cup is full of amazing grace. Man, a free gift. The free gift of forgiveness of sin and not only eternal life with God, but a relationship with Christ that actually gets us through today and tomorrow. And so as you think about Jesus' shed blood for the forgiveness of sin, just know that this is absolutely amazing, amazing grace. So let's take it and drink it together. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for a chance to, in our heart of worship, display who you are by remembering the death and resurrection of yourself. Lord Jesus, we thank you for going all the way for us. We thank you for extending that amazing grace to each one of us. And so, Jesus, I pray that as we have examined ourselves and we have partaken <clears throat> in this supper, Lord, I pray that you would just continue to remind us about all the good things that you have given us in the midst of sometimes it feeling like chaos in our world. So, Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, would you, would you continue to lead and guide us and engage our hearts in who you are? And I ask all this in your name. Amen. So we're going to continue to celebrate. So let's stand together and let's continue in worship. your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us in the slaughters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart.
You may be seated. Like, where did everybody's clap go? Did, it, did COVID get that or what? Oh, man, that's so good. Isn't it great to be together? Man, I just love worshiping with the church family. It's just so, so good. And I needed that. I needed that this morning. And I hope that you needed that and that you enjoy being with one another. And uh, I don't know about what your weeks have been like, but it's been a little nuts uh, for us as staff and leadership. But uh, God has been good. His grace is enough. And uh, all I can say is I needed that this morning. Um, how'd the baptism go? Amazing. Yeah, right on. And it was uh, a student that attends our student ministry, right? One of the junior youth were baptized this morning. Right on. So it was really good. It's good. So uh, lately, we and I have been, be, been preparing for the fall and even looking into this next year and what it all brings. And, and I just, again, have been totally reminded about how weird things really are. Do you, do you feel that too? Just how weird things out are and how fragile things are? It's been really interesting. I mean, we are here in September already, remembering back already to March, and we're here in September where it's the long weekend, students are going back to school, it's a little bit weird for them. We have college and university students that are going back to school, it's been a little weird for them too. Classes online, some classes in, you know, it's just a real weird time. But one of the things that I often think about is during the last seven months, is that how COVID has affected the lives of so many people. And Calvary Church family's not out of that. It's affected a lot of our people as a church family too. There are some mom and dads who are and have been going back to work, but there are some parents that aren't going back to work because they've lost their jobs. And maybe you've been in relationships with people where that, that kind of conversation has happened and, and, and you just kind of go, man, I'm just so thankful for where... I am at as an individual or a family because I'm going back to a job. 
And it's really interesting. It's reminded me once again that no matter where I am at in my life, no matter where you are at in your life, and it was crazy. I, I was sitting at my desk this week, and, and, and Phil texted me the songs, and all these songs came up, these three songs came up, and two of them were about the grace of God, and that's exactly kind of where my headspace was at. But did you know that it's only because of the grace of God that we can do anything? And so I just want to say this, no matter where you're at, you might be struggling and saying, I don't have a job to go back to, and there are some of our church family that's doing that. Just understand that God is, hasn't forgotten you. He knows exactly what needs to happen in your life, but we as a church family are with you on that. We will support you and encourage you however that may look. But you're a person, you might be a person who's gone back to a job. Just know that that's the grace of God. It's not everything, anything that I've done or you have done. It's only by the grace of God. And I just say, wow, wow, wow. And we need to be reminded about that all the time. Now, I hope regathering has been good for you. Has regathering been good for you? Being together, yeah, exactly. It's been good. And, and we hope, again, as we move forward, there'll be more and more people uh, that will uh, be out as we cap things uh, at 100. I, I just want you to know this, that over the last seven months, God is transforming the lives of people. And I just wrote some things down here in regards to our own church family and community about what God has done. God has actually saved people, brought him into a relationship with him over COVID-19. There's also, God has been using Calvary in their finances to help those who are in need. God has been faithful to us in our finances, so get this, so that we can actually bless other people. I mean, who would have ever thunk, right? Like, it's so good to see what God is doing. There's people that are realizing that in the midst of COVID-19 and the separation, that people actually need one another. And so we've had to ramp up our merge group team because we have people saying, hey, listen, I need to get into a merge group. And that has just been so good to see. I mean, God has done so many amazing things through COVID-19. And I know a lot of us in our human nature were saying, well, COVID-19 has done so many negative things. But again, that's just my personality type. God has just, uh, he's done so many good things too. And I think the good things outweigh the bad things. I really do. And he is stretching people. He's stretching people because they have lost their jobs. And he's making those people just dig a little deeper and leaning into him. And I received a message again by text from one of our church members. And he just said this about his family. I don't know where our family would be without the support of the Calvary Church family. It's been an amazing thing to see how many people have connected with other people, reaching out by phone, text, email, even now sitting kind of, you know, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, one-on-three in the church parking lot or even at Timmy's, you know, in their parking lot to just build relationship. And it's just been so, so good. And then this week, or actually the last couple weeks, when we sent out our ministry plan, and we're really excited about our ministry plan, and if you haven't looked at our ministry plan, please go to our website. The PDF is right there. There's a video that goes along with it. But man, we are excited about our ministry plan and what God's doing. But I, 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 need, to, I need you to know this right up front. I'm a little nervous. There are even a little bit of doubts in, in where we're going. But seeing what God has done over the last seven months, God can do anything. Everything is possible with God, correct? And man, we're going to be stretched as a faith community. I'm going, to be faith, I'm going to be stretched as a person of faith, but that's okay. And we're in this together. I mean, our graphic couldn't say it any better. Together in spirit, no matter where you are, together in spirit, we're just going to regather in a different way. We're going to regather in a different way. But again, I've just been reminded, we don't deserve anything that I just described to you just a little bit ago. With all the great things that are going on, we don't deserve any of that. 
And here's the, here, here's the default for some of us, and I include myself in this, is sometimes when we make decisions and we make right decisions, we get all confident and we get a little bit arrogant. And we begin to say things like, well, look at what I've done. Look at the decisions that I've made, maybe in my family or organization or company or in your job, whatever it might be. Look at the decisions that I have made. And I would have to say since March 16th, when I got the first phone call when I was in Florida, I have been so proud of our staff and our board teams leading our church through the last seven months. They have made some incredible, incredible wise decisions, but we've learned along the way too. We've made some decisions that, oh, you know what, we got to go back to the drawing board. But just understand that the decisions that we make, we cannot, we cannot go to a place where it's been all about us. It's, again, only by God's grace that he has given each one of us the capacity to make the decisions that we are making as a family, individuals, and as a church. And what's the really great thing about this? And you can tell me if I'm wrong afterwards through email or even through a conversation. I think he has brought our church closer together in unity than it's ever been before in the midst of COVID-19. Now, you may have an argument for me later on, but that's just what I'm sensing right now is that people are reaching out and they're talking and having a relationship and it's absolutely amazing. And so again, just be careful. We cannot say that it's been because of our human efforts that we have been able to go through the last seven months with the decisions that we have actually made. Because I have found out in my own journey and with talking with others that when I feel inadequate or they feel inadequate, God seems, and I said this to Becky and Marty this morning, it seems that when we're inadequate, that's when God uses us the most. It's not out of our arrogance or our, our strong natures or our personality that God does anything. It's when we feel inadequate. See, here's what scripture says. God chooses to use the foolish to shame the wise. And then he uses the weak to shame the what? The strong. And when, it, when we're confident in ourselves, God reminds us that we cannot do anything by ourselves, especially as we move forward into September with our ministry plan and head towards January when we have no idea what's going to happen, whether the borders are op open up, no matter what school's going to do, no matter what COVID-19 does, man, it's got nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the God of the universe, and he has everything under control. Do you believe that? I hope so. Man, we have to stand in the victory that Jesus Christ gives us. And we celebrated that already this morning in our heart of worship. So can I just say this? Stay close to Jesus. Would you help me stay close to Jesus? We will help you stay close to Jesus. Because I know that Satan is just dying to see church families ripped apart, to see families ripped apart in the midst of COVID-19. And can I just be honest? There's some crazy people out there with COVID-19. And I say that with the, the, the most love and humbleness as possible, but there's some crazy people out there. And we just got to remember that we need to give each other a break during this time. I haven't said much about COVID-19. I haven't said much about what black life matters and all that kind of stuff. You can read some of the stuff that I put on our website. But just know that this world, the world that we're living in, the Bible speaks of it. And we shouldn't be surprised about what's going on. And what Christ wants us to be is a light to the world in the midst of everything else. And so that's why I stay, say, stay close to Jesus. Do all you can to encourage one another, young or old, to stay close to Jesus. Please do that. So today we're kicking off Vision One Sunday. 
And then next week, like I said, together in spirit, praying as one. You will not want to miss this service either in person or online. We're going to have a prayer focus. We're going to have a music ministry focus. We're also going to have an anointing focus. But we are going to be spending time as a church family together. And it's going to hopefully encourage you. And then we're going to hopefully, we're praying for good weather. But hopefully it'll be nice so that we can actually have our roast beef dinner together. And then after that Sunday, on the 20th, Pastor Andrew is actually going to give us vision number two. And I'm not going to steal his thunder. All I'm going to say is panel discussion. That's all I'm going to say. All right? So look forward to these uh, next two Sundays, and it's going to be good. So here we go. Open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 28. Matthew, chapter 28. And we're going to start rocking and rolling through this. And if you don't like or you don't um, really dig the next couple Sundays... And if you don't get anything else out of these Sundays, here's what I want you to remember. Hashtag, love God, love others, make disciples. Hashtag, love God, love others, and make disciples. And for the next few Sundays, we're going to actually be talking about this hashtag. The Vision Sundays are set up in regards to our ministry plan that we sent out. So please take a look at that. And we want to expand on this hashtag. So this passage, Matthew 28, 16 to 20, people have spoken on this for centuries. And I know some of you are probably just rolling your eyes going, all right, Craig, how can we get something else out of the great commission or the great omission or the great go mission, whatever you want to call it, right? Like for years we've been listening to this. But I just think that this passage speaks to us as a church in the midst of COVID-19. And so here's what I'd like you to do. I would like you to stand because we're going to read it together and we're going to stand just to show God respect for who he is and for his word. And we're going to rock and roll through this. So let's read it together. I'll, I'll, I'll lead you in it, but just follow along. Uh, this is Matthew 28, 60 to 20. It'll also be on the screen. Here's what it says. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Get this. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to him, said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And here it is. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father in heaven, may your Holy Spirit guide us and direct us. Give me clarity as we engage our hearts again and point people in the direction of Jesus. And I ask all this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. So anybody that knows me or gets to know me will understand that there are times when I can be forgetful. I can be forgetful. So even as we've been living the last seven months with our staff, working from home, working from the office, working from home, working from the office. How many of you have enjoyed working at home? Yeah, at home, office, home office, and all that kind of stuff. There are times when I have forgotten things at home or at the office. There have been times that I have forgotten my laptop. There's times when I've forgotten my glasses. There's times when I have forgotten my keys. There's times when I have forgotten my mask, my hand sanitizer, because my mind has just been swimming with all kind of ministry and life stuff. Do you get me on that? Like, is your mind swimming? It probably is. And then to make matters worse, Sometimes I can live so much in the here and now, ask my family, ask my wife, that I really don't care what's going on around me and what's going on down the road. That's exactly how I can live. And when I first decided to follow Christ, I don't know how many of you remember when you made that decision to follow Christ, but I was that guy that was so excited that when people would ask me, to go and do something in the name of Christ, I would just say this, let's go get them. Let's go get them. Let's go do it. I don't care what it is, 
I will share my life story with anyone. But here's what it did. It caused a lot of damage. It caused a lot of damage. And here's what I've learned over the years about my zeal or my passion to see people come to know Christ. I needed to understand this first. I needed to understand what God was calling Craig Danielson to. I need to understand what he was calling Craig Danielson to do. Do you get that? You need to understand what God is calling you to do. See, I had passion without knowledge. And see, and to be honest with you, sometimes it's easier to move someone with passion and no knowledge than with someone with so much knowledge and no passion at all. It's just the way it is. And see, and I am very thankful that God has made me that way. He's created me that way. That's my nature. Kind of like, let's go do it. And like I said before, there's nothing that's impossible. Sometimes staff will look at me like, I, you know, deers in the headlights. Like, Craig, what are you thinking? Like board teams have looked at me and said, Craig, what are you thinking? Hey, here's the thing. Everything, and I mean everything, everything is possible but it just may take a little extra work. That's my personality type. But one of the things that would have been so helpful for me when I was being discipled was before I decided, before I decided that I was going to save the world, that I actually understood that God himself was seeking to save the world just a little bit more than me. That's who he is. And in this passage that we just read, what I believe Jesus is going to do, he's actually going to land a truth for all of us this morning to help us understand is that if we're going to join him in what he is doing, if we're going to join him in the mission, we need to understand that it's all about him and not about us. See, the problem in our culture we do what we think we should do. And then the church has told us that Jesus is going to actually make our life just a little bit better. That the whole goal of your life and my life is you got to do what you got to do. And we say a little prayer so that we don't go to hell. And then Jesus will just help our lives just be that much better. So it's kind of like your little tag on buddy. I just need Jesus for the times when I don't feel like I can get through this world. But see, in the middle of all this conversation that Jesus is going to have, he actually throws a command in there that tells us something about who he is. That he loves every individual human being. He adores every human being. But again, it's not about us. It's not about us. See, the, the purpose of the story of the Bible is about who? It's about God. It's about him. It's about what he can do in and through our lives. And so in this story, just to give you some background, in this story, Jesus has already died. He's already come back to life. He's been seen by, by a few people, and he's told the guys in Matthew that he wanted them to meet him at a certain hill. So meet me over there. So he could give them some final instructions before he left them. And in verse 16, check out verse 16. Here's what he says, or here's what it says. It says, the disciples went where? The disciples went to Galilee. And I like that. You know why I like that? Because I would have done the same thing. As I followed Christ, I would do the same thing. If you said go, I would be there. But then it says some worship and some were still what? Doubting or skeptical. But then he's going to land a huge truth for everyone. And this truth is actually is what's going to fuel the direction for the rest of their lives and the way that he wants them to go. 
Now again, if you've heard other talks about the Great Commission, it's usually a guy who stands up front, has a headband around his head, has a whistle around his neck, he's got a board of plays stuck in the middle of his pants, and he's got his, and, and it's like this coach, and he's going, go, 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 and he's just kind of yelling, go, go, go. Well, guess what? I don't need to do that this morning. Jesus has already done that in this passage. All I want to do is relay what Jesus is trying to say to these disciples. And so no yelling, there might be some passion, but no yelling. But it's just, here's what Jesus is landing in the lives of these disciples, and I think he's landing in our lives right here. See, we talk about making disciples We talk about baptism, and we get all excited about baptism. We get all excited about teaching, and I get excited about teaching. And we do everything in verses 19 and 20, and we miss the fact, we miss the fact that the fuel to engage in this life is not found in verses 19 and 20. But guess what? It's found in verse 18. So do you see in verse 19 where it says, go therefore? Go therefore. So again, another quick little Bible study. When you see the word therefore, we have to see what the therefore is. Therefore, exactly. And the therefore, the reason why it's there is that it goes back to what Jesus was talking about before. Everything that is based here is what I've told you before. And here's what he says in verse 18. Check this out. It says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Underline that verse. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, one of the things that's a statement here, it has to bring us to a question. Is what does the word all mean? A-L-L. What does that word mean? So I did a 20-hour in-depth study of the word all in the Greek in the Hebrew and here's what the word all means and I'm just kidding about the 20 hours Do you know what the word all means it means all it actually means all we don't have to go any deeper it just says all authority how much authority does Jesus have he has all he has everything Now, on one level, sometimes we teach this as, therefore, therefore, because he has all authority, then doggone it, we better get out there, we better submit to his allegiance, and we better do what he tells us to do. And you know what? That, that, in some respects, that's a true statement. We need to follow the instructions of what Christ tells us to do. But here's another side to it. Because he has all authority... Get this, I will pay him the correct allegiance that he is owed, but again, what I believe he is telling us is that he is also giving the disciples and us some comfort to add the fuel to the fire in what he's called us to do. See, I believe he wants us who call ourselves Christ followers to understand that he is the controller of of the universe, that he is the controller of all the events that happen in this world. It's basically him saying this, I started this whole thing and I will end this whole thing. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I actually have a handle on this COVID-19 thing. I am the king of kings and lord of lords. And I just want to tell you before I let you go, I am king. I am king. That's actually going to be the fuel to the fire to carry out the mission. See, it's one thing to have a king that's powerful. It's another thing to have a king that has all authority. And he's throwing this in there at them to help them to begin to understand how important their task is going to be. When it says, I have done all of this, or I have all of this, that means that no one will ever have anything unless I give it to them. Nobody. So what you have in your life, 
What I have in my life, again, is all because of the grace of God. He has given you everything. He's given you everything. See, if you're a dad in this room, you don't have the authority over your family unless God gives you that authority. Hear me on this. If you're a dad in this room, you don't have the authority over your family unless God gives you the authority over your family. See, we can, as dads, pull up our pants as high as they can go, and we can make statements like this, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. We can actually make those kind of statements, but it's not going to do a hill of beans when it comes to the authority that we have within our family when God gives you that authority. That's the authority that we do not have. And then sometimes during COVID-19, as we're, we've been separated, we make these little jaunts down to Port Dalhousie. Some of you have done that because I've seen it on Facebook. You take pictures of the sunsets and all that kind of stuff, and, and it's just a beautiful, well, we've made our way through Niagara and the Lake, and, and Laura and I just go and sit. And then you know what happens when the sun is setting over Lake Ontario? You can actually see Burlington. You can actually see Oakville. And then you can see what? Toronto. And it's just a gorgeous sight. But here's where my mind goes. Including St. Catharines, if you make your way around the Golden Horseshoe, there are so many lost, lost people. And that goes through my mind. And it's how in the world can we actually land the gospel in St. Catharines, land the gospel in Burlington, Oakville, and Toronto. Not that we have to do it, but the church should be doing it. But we are living in some dark times, and sometimes it can be so discouraging. Cities, cities that have actually made statements about rejecting who God is. See, we have it in Canada too. Everybody goes, oh man, I'm so glad I don't live in the South. Sometimes I go, man, I want to go to the South. Because we don't have it any better here. Christians are just being squeezed. Lives are broken. And we have this Matthew 28 passage that says, man, what are we going to do about it? I mean, here in St. Catharines, we have drug addiction. We have sex trafficking. We have greed. We have infatuation with self. We have liberal decisions being made in our political systems. And we sit around and we talk about Justin Trudeau. That if it, was, it wasn't him in office, everything would be fine. And can I just say this? No, it wouldn't. But how do we land incredible news, this gospel that we are all excited about because God has transformed our life? How do we land it in a place that looks like this? How do we do that? And I've just been thinking, and here's here's what I put down. When When are God's people going to stand on the firm fact that it doesn't matter who's in power, doesn't matter who's in power, doesn't matter what's going on in our culture, doesn't matter what's going on around the world, or even what's going on in your life and in my life, whether it's illness, sickness, difficulty, or death, kids that are going off the deep end, spouses that are going off the deep end. Can I just say this? In the midst of all that, ladies and gentlemen, as Christ followers, Jesus has all authority. He's got all authority. Nobody has anything on us as believers in Christ. He has all authority. See, I think we need to stop allowing our world to dictate where the authority lies. Jesus said it right here. Jesus is king. He is king. And Jesus is standing in front of these men saying that this is what I want to give you. This is the fuel for the fire and the mission that I'm about to hand off to you. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And guess where Jesus, his hands go? It goes right out to who? Right out to us. 
and he says, I have all authority. Calvary Church, I have all authority. Merge groups, I have all authority. Student ministry, I have all authority. Kids ministry, I have all authority. Board of directors, I have all authority. And that's what exactly what Jesus is saying. See, we don't make him Lord, he is Lord. We don't give him power, he contains all power. And when Jesus stand, stood in front of them, he wanted them to know the mission that I'm about to hand to you is with all authority, all of it. And I'm not going to hold anything back. See, our God is not a mamby pamby guru that sits around telling us these deep things of life. He doesn't do that. He calls himself the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he demands allegiance from those who call themselves Christ followers. And God is not a God that is up in heaven looking down as some, like a death star or death spot in this world. But he offers grace. He offers forgiveness. And I believe that the church, the church in general, needs to reconnect to this in the midst of COVID-19 because I think not just us, but the church in general has lost a sense of mission since COVID-19 because it's, all, it's been all about who? Us. It's been about us. How do I protect myself? How do I protect my family? How do I protect the church? And it's become about us. And if we don't get to that point again, where it says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee, then we're washed up. We're washed up. We have to get to that point again. And if we don't get to that point, here's what happens. All of a sudden, it begins to be about me again, and we start fighting about the smallest things. And then we also get this attitude like this. Yeah, Jesus did get all the authority. Here it is. But he's given me just a little bit more. And then we think we have the right to go and begin all these little underground things where it's about me. And I've heard stories in churches that COVID-19 is eating up churches from the inside out. So don't think it doesn't, it doesn't happen, because it does. People think that Jesus left them a little bit more authority than he's got. And that's why you have to look down and you have to see the therefore. And that therefore is a really big therefore. And he wants to give them confidence and also an excitement about the mission that they're just about to be handed. And then he says this, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. See, and based upon that, based upon that, now it's time to go and get involved in what God wants us to do. And sometimes, just sometimes, we wonder what he means by going and making disciples. Sometimes we wonder what discipleship is or what disciple making is all about. And there's all kinds of books out there on discipleship and disciple making. So I thought I would Google it. And there's some, again, some really great material out there. I found 91 books. 91 books on what discipleship or disciple-making is all about. 91. People that was, would quote right on the cover, this is what discipleship is. This is what discipleship is. And so I thought out of those 91 books, I'm going to write a book. Just kidding. But I want to give you my humble opinion on what I think disciple-making is all about. And it all comes... It all comes from verse 18. It all comes from verse 18. And here's what I believe disciple-making is all about. And it comes back to what Jesus says in verse 18. He says this, and this is what I mean by this. To make sure, it's what he says out of verse 18, to make sure that people see 
that inside of Jesus, all authority rests. Inside of Jesus, all authority rests. Everything. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only what? Life. There's no way to the Father except through Jesus. See, he's the one who is, the one who started it all and will finish it all. He holds everything together by the power of his name, and even in Colossians 1, he says he holds everything together in your and my body. Take a look at it. He holds everything together. And at the end of the day, what it means to make a disciple is to bring, in, bring, in someone, in, to bring someone into contact with the reality of who Jesus is and then for them to realize, I am not the authority. Jesus is. That's disciple making. Jesus has all the authority and it's not about me. Because when it's not about me, I can say, Lord, I'm going to consecrate my life to you. I'm going to surrender everything to you because it's not about me. And then he gives us these two words that are participles, and I won't take the time to, to break those apart, but it's the word baptize and teach. And when he says to make a disciple, he's going to actually tell us exactly what that means. And he does that in verse 19. When you make disciples... One of the things that you and I will be doing is baptizing them into the full reality of who God is. See, in other words, we're going to immerse them into everything that we just talked about, that, God ha that Jesus has all authority into this triune God. And they're going to change and make their li lives no longer about themselves, but they make their lives about him. That's what the goal is. But can I just say this? It's hard living in a culture like ours to actually make that happen or decide or to choose to make that happen. See, everything that has happened in Christianity, in my opinion, over the last 100 years has been all about my Lord and Savior. Hear me on this. My Lord and Savior. And on one end, that's a great thing to have. That's a great reality. But what we've done is we've actually degraded Jesus in a lot of ways. And we've degraded him to a private Lord and Savior. Write that word down, private Lord and Savior. I'm going to have him as my own, get this, little thing. I'm not going to talk about him. I'm going to keep him close to me. He's going to change my life, and he's going to make it all kinds of better, but guess what? I'm going to have my own private closet Christianity. My own private Lord and Savior. And right there, we've degraded Jesus to the lowest common denominator. See, there are non-believers who will watch you as a Christ follower and say, you know what, that's good for you. Whatever floats your boat, whatever turns your crank, you go ahead and do that. But here's what I know from church history. That baptism during the time of Jesus had nothing to do with my own private Lord and Savior. Had nothing to do with that. Baptism was the way that Christians would proclaim to the world that I'm actually leaving one group of people and joining who? Who? joining Jesus, leaving a group and joining Jesus. That's what baptism did. And one of the things that Laura and I thought about when, when we were raising our kids in a Christian home was, listen, we don't want to push them to be baptized. Baptism, I think, is a huge, huge deal. We want them to totally understand when they get immersed, when they get dunked, as sometimes we call it, when they get dunked, they absolutely know that their life is now taking that turn and saying it's not just about my private Lord Jesus, it's actually about a public thing. And I'm going to surrender my life. 
When you get immersed in that water, everything, can I say this? Everything changes. And we follow Jesus as we are devoted to him. See, at the end of the day, baptism was never meant as a clever little event for a quick picture. But it was a proclamation, get this, of the lordship of Jesus in my life and in your life, in the life of a Christ follower. It was what Christians did at that time, even though, get this, even though they were being persecuted. And here's how they were being persecuted, just a little window into church history. Nero, Nero would actually dunk Christian bodies in wax and light them on fire to light his courtyard at night. And you know what people would say? I don't care. He can light me on fire. He can dunk me as many times in wax as he wants, but you know what? I'm still going to proclaim Jesus. And people were burned to death. Christians were burned to death because of their outspoken boldness in love and truth to people. That's where you start in the waters of baptism that now it's a public thing. It's us telling the world, telling each other that I have stepped into this relationship with, get this, all authority. All authority. Think about this just for a second. If those people back then would have kept their Jesus private, they would have never had to worry about persecution. Never. But in baptism, what it did is it blew the doors wide open in their faith life and they said it was not going to be a private thing anymore. We are going to follow Jesus and we will do what it takes to tell the world about him. And in some respects, I find this sometimes even in my own life creeping up and we have to fight against it because it's the evil one. I think the church has lost the capacity to look at a lost and dying world and say this, Jesus provides grace. He provides hope. He provides forgiveness. But it's not about a little private Lord and Savior. It's about a public thing. See, if we are looking at where we're going next year, and again, you're going to be hearing more about where we're going, there's no better time to be alive than today. And in some respects, the best is yet to come. Because God has been at work in seven months, and we can't deny that. And you'll be hearing some stories next week about what God is doing in the lives of people. But I hope that we as Calvary Church will be bold and courageous about our faith in grace and truth with our friends, with our families. We've had seven months to build relationships with the, the neighbors that we live with. And it's been amazing the stories that you hear about people just over the fence and how you can just continue to build relationship with them and inject Jesus in to where it's just normal conversation. And sometimes I look at myself and I go, Craig, why don't you talk about Jesus more? Because again, that creeps up. And I think sometimes we all struggle with that. But I, always, I just came down to one answer. It's because I don't think God is big, is as big as we think he is. God, can you really show up when I talk to Greg across the street? God, would you sh really show up when I talk to Paul over my neighbor uh, in, in the back of us? God, would you just show up instead? It's just like, I'm just going to barbecue. Man, have we boiled down God to just being a mamby-pamby? Here, here it is, my little friend. And I struggle with that too. But in this verse, it's reminded me, Jesus has all authority and he's handed it to us we have all authority through jesus and so what are we afraid of so i remind myself too 
Have you ever sat or stood with someone and had a conversation about what they're passionate about? And sometimes you're rolling your eyes because you go, I have things to do. I know you've been there. I've been there. I've done that. But man, couldn't we actually be that passionate about who Jesus is? Stand around and talk about him. Just like it's second nature. We should be able to do that. But there are so many people who have experienced Jesus in the last seven months, you're going to hear about it. You're going to hear about it. But here's what it does. It doesn't stop there, and I'm almost done. And sometimes this is where we get messed up. Sometimes we think, okay, we got baptism. We've baptized someone. They're all right, so we can let them go. They're on their own. But again, this is part of disciple making. He he goes on to say this in verse 20. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Now see, as a, as a church, as Calvary Church, our vision is this, to equip people to become devoted followers of Jesus. To equip people to be devoted followers of Jesus. And that's why we have things set up the way we do so that people can go from chair one to chair four and have a system of carrying through in their life as a Christ follower. See, we need to grow in that, we need to know it, and we actually need to learn it and display it and dive into it. And we also need to absorb it and fall in love with the God who has a mission for us and has all authority so that we can keep going. And God says, I know the way this world works. I know how you work. I know how you're designed. But he just says, follow me. And can I just say this? It's not just about education. It can't be just about education. It has to be about living it. And that's why you've heard us say before, invest and invite. Invest in people. We've had seven months to invest in our families and in our neighbors and the people that we have come in contact with. And see, and, uh, uh, Nikolai, if you can just put that graphic up of the four chairs, it's just so simple. Is that we have four chairs, the lost, the believer, the worker, the disciple maker. We want someone who, who is, who we just say, come and see, come and see. Not just come and see our building, come and see, you know, these fantastic speakers we have, come and see, you know, whatever. Come and see Jesus. Come and see Jesus lived out amongst our church family. Come and see. And then as they decide to follow Jesus, they sit in the believer chair, and and Jesus just says, follow me. And that's part of equipping people. And then we move into the worker chair, and that's where we're going to equip people. Fish for me. And that's where workers need to work for Jesus. But here's the problem. 87% of people just stay in that chair, where we want to work people into being a disciple maker. We want people to actually move out of chair three to chair four where you are actually leading your neighbors to Jesus and discipling them. Not saying, oh, I'm going to bring them to church and let Craig and Andrew and Susie do it. No, it's you disciple somebody. You get the joy and the excitement of sitting across a table and being able to just engage with one another in who Jesus is. It's awesome. We have to get together with other believers also. And that's part of living it so that you can share your life, you can share your marriage, you can share your kids, you can share your work. Students can share their school with a mentor that will just come alongside them. And so not only the four chairs, but that's why we call ourselves an orange church where we have the light of the church and God's word and we actually have home is where the heart is and we bring those two influences together to make orange because it reminds us that we need to reach the next generation. And we have these two influences that can do so much in the life of someone who's younger. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus has all the authority. And as we move into this fall, we want you to come along on the journey with us to know that you need to be a part of a merge group and do life together, that we need to be hospitable to the people around us, We need to be bold in the proclamation of who Jesus is in our own life when it comes up. And that's what this Matthew 28 passage shows us 
and encourages us to do in this world. So in the next couple Sundays, as we pray as one, and then as Pastor Andrew again challenges us in our vision, I hope that we will stay focused on Jesus and understand that making a disciple is about understanding that Jesus has all authority and it's all about him. Are you okay with that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for allowing us to see through this really dramatic story that you have all power, you have all authority, and you want us to be part of your mission. So God, I pray that as we just continue to encourage one another, challenge one another, grow together, learn together, we reach out together, God, I pray that we will see you so front and center that we cannot ignore you. God, thank you for the lives that you're changing. Thank you for your grace. Protect us from the evil one. And may we serve you with a passion that is contagious. And I ask all this in your name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us today in person. Thanks for joining us online. And uh, we will see you next week. Don't forget to sign up by Wednesday uh, for the roast beef lunch. And uh, again, uh, keep loving one another, okay? Take care. See you later. Yeah.